Hello everyone, this is Alvin from Inside Pool TV. This video is going to be hosted by Chris Hightower from the International Q Makers Association. Along with Inside Pool TV, we're going to be having a Q Makers contest this year at the 2018 Super Billiards Expo. I'd like you to find the International Q Makers Association booth, bring your best Q, we'll film it, put it into the contest, and we'll see who comes out on top. You can also send us information about your queue to statmaster at propool.com. So without further ado, here is Chris Hightower. He's going to explain all about making queues, all his queue maker friends, the contest, and just give you a little bit of a, a show about queue maker. Hello, my name is Chris Hightower, and I'm the uh, director of the International Queue Makers Association. You know, when uh, Ron Hoffman called me and uh, started talking to me about uh, our members doing a cue makers uh, contest. I was saying, you know, that sounds like a really good idea. And as the more we talk about it, the more excited I'm getting about it. You know, I just want to introduce myself. Uh, not only am I the director, I've been building cues for since 1988. I'm the owner of Cue Man Billiard Products and High Tower Custom Cues. And when we founded the Cue Makers Association in 2004, you know, we were looking to uh, have a, a group that had uh, entries for all levels of Cue Makers, those who were building super artistic high dollar cues, and those who were just starting as apprentices, and those that are kind of in the middle, they're repairmen and they might build a few cues, but their main focus is on repairs. You know, and as as we did this, and as time went on, you know, I wrote a book on cue building how to and did the DVD series. So I know a little bit about cue making, and I'm and I used to be a fairly good player. I'm not so good anymore. As you can see, there's a few gray hairs on this head of mine, and I'm 56 years old now, so not quite the player I once was. But you know, when you start talking about uh, cue making, there would be no cue makers if there weren't players. So this is trying to introduce the players to cue makers and not only cue making and but also cue collecting not just playing with the cues see there's cues out there that are that are never going to have a ball hit with them because they're so pristine and so nice that they wind up getting put in safes and uh, museums and different things like that and I've built cues like that that sold for thousands of dollars but I also build players cues that sell for a few hundred dollars, and so do most of the other cue makers. You know, when you talk about the International Cue Makers Association, you say, well, who's it made up of? You know, we have, first of all, we have our Hall of Fame cue makers. We have some of the best cue makers on the planet in our association. We have Bob Mucci. He doesn't, he's been in our Hall of Fame since 2006, and we're just naming some of the living ones. You know, we have deceased cue makers, you know, in our Hall of Fame, but we'll get to their to them later. Let's talk about the living ones, the ones that are doing it now. We got Dennis Diekman, a master of butterfly and carom cues, and David Kersenbrock, just an all-around genius, and Leonard Bloodworth, who not only built great cues, but he built cue machinery for decades, and Dan James of Josh Cues, and Thomas Wayne, one of the best CNC cue artists on the planet, and the Smelky family, who builds cues in the players range and have for decades. They're probably the oldest uh, continuing cue making operation in the United States or maybe even the world. You got Ernie Gutierrez of Gina Q and Bill Schick and Gordon Hart that founded Viking Q and Richard Helmstetter of Adams Q and Richard Black and Bill Schick and so we got all of these really great Hall of Fame cue makers. You know, and then we got the next generation of Hall of Famers. These are not in there yet, but, you know, they're some of the next in line, I would say. It started in the late 80s and early 90s building cues. We got Joe Porper, and, you know, he also come out with his cue lathes and uh, many things, and he was famous for his cases, but he was also a master cue builder, and some don't know. He's not as well known for that as he says some of the other stuff. We got another master cue maker, Paul Drexler, P. D Studios and Dale Perry, who builds a lot of cues more than most of us, and Dennis Searing, who's known for his really clean work and sharp, detailed work, and Jerry Powers of Jericho Cues and all the innovations he's done. And of course, myself. Hopefully, one day I'll get into the Hall of Fame. 
You know, and then we, and you know, and you say, well, but what about these younger cue makers? Well, some of them are not so young. You know, Paul Drexler got into cue making when he was a little bit on up there in age compared to most. But we have a new millennial generation of cue makers coming up. We've got Chris Byrne and Eric Crisp of Sugar Tree and Eddie Cohen and Justin Hightower. I'm a little bit partial to that one, of course. You see, he's got my last name. It's my son. Steve Lomax and John Rocker of Rocket Cues and Bob Daniels of BDQs and Gorbinko Andre from Russia and Ron Nelson from Canada and Hiroshi Sasaki from Japan and Mark Smith from Arkansas and Chad Carter from Kentucky. And we just have all these, you know, the cue making is in good hands in our association. We got the old guys, some of them are starting to retire like that, are slowing down like Dennis Deepman and a few others. Helmstetter, I think, is retired. Gordon Hart's retired. Some of these living ones have retired. But, you know, we're in pretty good hands. We got Don Owens of OBQs coming out with his great um, low deflection shaft system and his wood ferrule system and all of that. And Larry Vagas and Sheldon Lebo. So we have some really great cue makers that have come up in the last decade or two, you know, just to name a few. You know, as we're as we're going to do this program, we're going to start showing you some of the Hall of Fame cue makers cues. We might not do it in this episode, because what I want to do in this episode is I want to introduce you to the cue making contest. As we started trying to figure out what do we do, what do people want to see, so I finally narrowed it down to three categories for this year, and we may change it next year. The first category is traditional point masters series. The next category is the Butterfly Points Masters category. And then there's the Artistic Inlays Masters category where people can push it to the limit on inlays. Those cues will not have traditional points. It'll be all inlay work. It can have points, but they won't be the traditional style. And we'll explain that, what Butterfly Points are, what traditional points are, and what Artistic Inlays. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go get some stuff from my shop. I'm gonna come back up and I'm going to uh, just sit down at the table with you a minute and show you some of these different things to where you'll understand because we're going to let the public do the voting on this. The people who play in inside pool uh, events and different ways he's going to present this and have a panel of judges judging it to narrow it down. But you're going to see a lot of really beautiful cues and we want you to understand the kind of things you should look for when you're voting for a cue. And not only when you're voting for a cue, did you know every time you go cue shopping, you are voting for a cue? When you pick that cue out, whether it's a $30 uh, uh, cue that you get from one of the big box stores or you're picking out a several hundred dollar custom cue or maybe even several thousand dollar custom cue, there's things you should look for. To, to The number one thing with cue building is how does it play? Does it play good to you? Is it balanced right? Does it feel good to you? And only you can answer those questions because there are people that like cues that hit really hard and solid like the straight pool players. And then you got the, the nine ballers on the slow cloth that really want some action in their cue. And there's ways to taper the shaft and use certain materials in the joints to produce that. But we can't judge how a cue plays from video. So what we're going to do is we're going to show you we're going to show you how to look at a cue in person and know whether it's quality made, but we're also going to show you how to look on video and we're going to give you close-up pictures and we're going to let you decide which of these cues deserve to make these honors the best and you're going to have three places to vote and we're not going to show you who made the cues at first. We're going to let you do the voting and then we're going to reveal the names of the people who were on the cues. That way you're voting for the cue itself and not for not for a brand name because everybody would back up their favorite cue maker if we did that. And we've seen that done over and over at, at different uh, cue competitions. We'll see a cue not nearly as nice or anything, but it's from a well-known cue maker, so it gets voted on. So we're not going to do it that way. We're going to turn the logo's face down. We're going to shoot the pictures. But what I want to do next is I want to go get some things from my shop. And I want to show you what a full splice point is. I want to show you what a v-groove point is. I want to show you what... Uh, some simulated point work is where you'll have an understanding of what we call a traditional point and then some what we call a butterfly point and then what we call uh, artistic inlay masters so and just 
I'll just be back in just a little bit with all of these materials and we'll sit down and show you some things. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and start uh, showing you a cue that's in the butterfly category. And this would be a butterfly point blank. As you can see, it's the rounded points. That's what makes it a butterfly. And here's an example of a cue that has one in it. You see the butterfly here. But this cue would not go in the butterfly cue category because... The main points in the forearm are regular V-points. We've done two ways on this cue. This is a Hightower custom cue that uh, we built. I'm uh, getting ready to go to a show here. and We got it ready to go. And This is what's called a full splice cue. And the difference is, this is still traditional points. You see that this is one piece of wood. There's no joint in the middle. Like on this cue here, there's a joint right in the middle right where the points meet this is also considered a traditional point see the points are sharp they come to a sharp point it does have inlay work in it but it would be considered a traditional point and even though you know looking at the bottom of the queue there are inlays in the queue and you know this is just something you know and this is called the handle so let's just go through the pieces on the queue a minute this is the joint joint pin those are called joint rings, and when you have silver or something like this stuck in there in slots, that's called slot rings or stitch rings. This old piece here is called the forearm, all the way to this A joint. They call this the A joint in the queue, or the wrap joint. And then this is the handle. This is the butt sleeve, and these are inlays, turquoise and mother of pearl. But you can see how the traditional style of points goes. Well, you know, you could go to something as simple as a full splice, what we, you know, call full splice cues, fancy ring work, uh, full splice here, no inlays in the rest of the cue other than the joint work. You could enter a cue like that if you wanted to. A cue like that is not likely to win the contest. And then, uh, you know, we've already shown you the uh, butterfly here. But there's another way to build butterflies, and that's to make them longer. I don't know if the if you can quite pick that up, but see the different layers coming all the way from one end of the queue to the other. And those are not quite as severe of an angle. And there's another queue. Now this one would go in the traditional points category because it is a mixture. See, it has traditional points here, and it has all these other little points cut over the top of it. That's something my son is been working on. It's not finished yet. Then another style of uh, making a cue fancy is to put uh, scrimshaw work in it. So if you can actually probably can't see the detail in that too well but there is a lot of fancy little work. That's by the late Ronnie Powell who was building cues? He's deceased now, but he was building them out of the Philippines as cue perfect cues, and he spent a lot of years over there as a missionary, and that's what he did to support himself. Now we showed you the full splice cue here. I want to show you some full splice blanks because I want to really make it. Uh, you got this is uh, the regular joint method with the A joint in it. This is full splice. Now here is one by the late Burton Spain, one of our Hall of Fame cue makers. He did a very unique splice here, the way he made his full splice to where he wouldn't have such a heavy cue with ebony coming all the way to the back. He did a full splice, what we call a butterfly. You can see the rounded there. And then over the top of that butterfly where he put this ebony in there, he went back and cut the ebony in and put all of these points in with veneers. He was a master of points. That would be a traditional style. Here's another Burton Spain blank that I have in my collection. I used to buy blanks from him and use them before I started building them myself and before he passed away. If he was still alive, I might not be building points today. I might would keep buying them from him. But you see, this comes in here and this is all one piece of wood all the way to the back. 
that's more of a traditional style of full splice with veneers. Now there's another type of, uh, we'll show you a forearm with just regular, we'll set these aside a second. You see here we have another, another blank, just plain points cut in. You can kind of see the end of the blank, how it attaches to the cue. Same here, you can see the end, how, how it does, and it's just cuts, they're just V's cut in there. And that's what they call V-style points. Well, we can show you how that goes together. You can see here. That screws together with a screw and a tenon. This is olive wood with one veneer around it. This would go in if this cue was completed and then laid out nice and whatever you wanted to do, it would go in the uh, it would go in the traditional points category. But if they do a forearm where this is the primary forearm in the cue, even if it has some other kind of uh, work inlay work, extensive inlay work, it's going in the butterfly category. Now artistic inlays. Scrimshaw will work. We will allow scrimshaw, but no decals. So no fancy decal cues are going to be able to compete. So when you have a cue, you know, you can, people can dress them up with exotic woods like this Amboyne or the sky's the limit on that. So I, I guess you have a pretty good understanding. You know, here's some more full splice blanks. Just simple points, no veneers, and then here's one with veneers. I'm going to move all that out of the way a second. And I want to put some more cues up here. Now, here is one. This was, we started, we considered this category for this year, but maybe next year if the butterfly category doesn't get a lot, we'll do what's called a box cue. And that's where you have more squared inlays, squared box. Some of them you can wrap them in veneers. This one is stair stepped on the end. Kind of more of a, I built a lot of, uh, Native American theme cues because I've got a good bit of that blood in me, so I'm told. Never took a DNA test, but looking at how black my daddy's hair is, and he's still got a good head of hair at 80 something years old and still going strong working, I, I believe them when they tell me that I've got a lot in me. But see, this is all exotic woods and uh, inlays, and so that's a box cue. That could be entered into the artistic inlays category. Now, or you could really, you know, go far out like this cue. This cue here has a uh, ivory and rubies and you come up here and it's got emeralds in it and uh, white sapphires. I don't know if they're going to sparkle under this light or not but ivory handle and seeing there are no traditional points in this cue. So this would be a classic cue to go into the thing. I'm not going to enter this cue. I've got another one in mind to enter. Uh, this one will, if I ever make it in the Hall of Fame, I may keep this one in my collection. Just to where I have a, a nice cue representing mine and my son's uh, work together, doing the stone work and putting it all in. I would sell it if the right price come along, but so far that hasn't happened. So I do collect cues, so I may keep it in my collection. Well, that gives you an idea of uh, the three categories. Got the butterfly, the extensive inlay work, and then the uh, B groove points. And that's going to be our three categories we're going to be voting on. Um, we'll, we'll have to establish some of the rules. You do have to be an, a member of the International Cue Makers Association to be able to submit a cue. You can submit one for each of the three categories. If I, I could submit these three right here, well, no, not this one because it doesn't have those in the points. But I do have a butterfly cue built, so I'll probably try to enter one also. But that is that is the introduction to the cue makers contest. This is just not meant to be an in-depth uh, kind of thing. It's just a little introduction. Maybe we'll do another one. I'll show you, uh, show you some of our Hall of Fame cue makers work in another episode. We'll 
get some of the collectors we know around here to bring some cues around and we'll uh, try to shoot a picture of some of them and show you what the Hall of Famers have done. What the guys from uh, Brittner's area all the way up to uh, Richard Black's, our last inductee in the living category, and Tim Scruggs, they just went in this past December and we'll look at some of their cues and just give you an idea of this whole art form of how it's progressed through the years. And um, we are uh, really thankful to get this opportunity that Ron Hoffman has opened up uh, Inside Pool TV to uh, sponsor this thing and put it in his heart to do it. And it just really sounds like a really fun idea and I hope we get a lot of participation. Well, now we're taking a look at, uh, I wanna show you a few things uh, before we conclude this introduction. I wanna show you some things to look at when you're going out looking for a uh, custom cube. Number one, you want to roll the cue on the table and side it down, make sure everything's straight, the shaft doesn't wobble, and so on. But other things is, like here at the joint, when you're looking at this area of the cue, you feel the joint and, you know, screw the shaft on it and rub your thumb along it and see if anything's off-center. Because you want your shaft to be concentric with the butt of the cue. And if, and if you feel a lip on one side, that means the pin may not be put in right or the insert may not be put in correctly into the cue. All of that can make for a, uh, for a cue that doesn't uh, play well or it's just, you know, it's just minor details. Gives you some idea about how good the cue maker is at his fit and finish. You want to make sure the finish, there's no flaws in it. Now, when you're looking at these uh, V-groove points and all, like this one has points going all over the place. I even backed up points against points and then laid the ivory in and put these uh, sapphires in between them. And, and as you look at the, uh, the points in the queue, you want to rotate it and look and see if the points are even. That's something people are pretty. It really doesn't matter on the uh, quality of the cue or the uh, or the the playability of the cue. It doesn't affect that at all. But collectors will really nitpick how even these points are. So if you want the cue to hold its value, you know, for resale, then you want to look and see if the points are even. Uh, you come down here and feel the rings and see. If you feel any anything lifted, that could all indicate that you need a, that the cue might already need a refinish. You come down here, you feel the rings. You rub your hand around the cue and and feel and see if you feel any uh, anything going on in the cue, any any wobbles, any high spots, anything like that can indicate, you know, things that that could be of better quality on the cue. The other thing is you want to look around the inlay work and look for glue lines and see how tight the inlay work was done. That that gives you another idea into what kind of craftsman the person who made the cue was. Something else that's real important. We'll lay another cue. We'll lay another cue up here. Is you want to feel like the wrap area and see if you can feel a big lip there or anything. See on this cue you feel down here. You know you want to even on the the lower end cues like this is just a player's cue that we uh, sell and it's you know just has nice ring work good nice joint beautiful wood and but you know when you feel the finish you you feel the wrap. You don't want to feel a lot. You want to know the, the linen is pressed, no lumps in it. All those things tell you that the cue maker really cared about his work. And if he really cares about it and he can produce those things, you know he has the skills that that cue should play solid all the way through because he's got an eye for details and he really pays attention to what he's doing. So some of those things that you're going to be judging the cues on. Remember, when you're judging them on inlay work, you look at the pictures, see if the points look even. I mean, you can go all through this queue and 
and these backing them up against each other with these diamonds pretty hard to to do and uh, you can see the sapphires does the finish does it sparkle is the finish nice now some people prefer a satin finish and that's okay if they meant to build it that way no lines around your inlays you want it all to be nice all the work to be nice and clean and that's the main thing you look and then it's the flow of the cue does the design make sense like the other day I saw a uh, a blank that I'd got out of a cue maker shop and and it had six uh, stitch rings going around it but it had five points and it didn't line up together and that's a very minor detail but to a collector that really means something so you have to decide on the level cue you want to buy is it going to be collector's grade or is it going to be players quality and those can be two different things but judging a contest people are supposed to bring out their best so I expect you when you look at the cue you to, you to critique it you to think of does the cue flow together does the design flow um, all of the little details can you see flaws in a camera because if you can see them with the camera then they're probably even more visible if we really zoom in with the camera or if we uh, were to look at the cue with a jeweler's loop or something and I'm not one that believes that you need to be looking at the cue under a microscope it's supposed to be uh, it's supposed to be uh, admired from arm's length and and that's the way it's supposed to be but in a cue making contest people are supposed to bring their best so you judge it like you expected them to bring their best yeah well that's that showed you a little bit about the cues the three categories how we're going to, a little bit about how we're going to run the contest and allow the cue makers to compete. You know, but as I want to talk to you as a player, I want to tell you, go and hit some cues. Hit with some balls with some cues. If you don't own a custom cue, I would encourage you to go try out some of these cue makers' cues and just hit a ball with one. See if somebody will let you try their cue and just see the difference that it makes. I can tell you, if you're going to a to a room and you're playing a league and you're picking up a off the wall cue you're not going to play to your potential you need to get a good well balanced well crafted cue in your hand make sure they put you a really quality tip on it because you can destroy the whole way a cue plays with a bad tip those of you that already have a few cues well you've already started cue collecting i'd say as far as cue collecting, I've been doing it since way before I started building cues. I've been collecting cues since the 70s. I have the first McDermott cue that I ever bought. I have uh, some of my early Mutis. I have my first Sean that I ever bought. You know, and you think, well, cue collecting, well, that cost a lot of money. Do you know the other day, I paid around $500 for that, uh, for that Sean and the little trade I did for it back in the 80s. You know, someone offered me $3,800 for that cue the other day, and I turned it down. What I'm saying is, if you are smart about your collecting, you collect the ones that are sought after, the ones that people really like, and you hold on to it, you won't lose money on the cue unless you really got a bad deal in the first place. Even the cues I bought brand new are, are worth three and four times what I paid for them brand new back in the 70s and the 80s. So that's not real good money in the stock market, I guess, but but cue collecting is fun. You get to lay your hands on it, you get to play with them, you get to look at them, you get to admire them. And you know, and there's there's a lot of joy comes with knowing when you get into play that you have an instrument in your hand that you feel good about, that you can trust it, it won't let you down, it'll perform like it needs to perform. And that's what I'm really thankful about with our International Cue Makers Association, we have what's called a Cue Makers Forum. In that forum, we, we get together, we share things, we help each other build and, and learn and build their craft and, and spot the, the, the best materials out there, what plays, what's giving trouble, what's not, the best glues to use, all these trade secrets. We pass these things back and forth so we can all get better. So when you go and you buy a cue from a Cue maker in the International Cue Makers Association, you know that you're getting a product that is going to be quality, and that's and we have a lot of really good cue makers in our association. I could point you toward this one or that one, and if you look in uh, you look in our cue gallery on the International Cue Makers page, you'll see some of the the levels of cues and what level they feel that that cue goes in for their pricing structure. 
Some of them have a way to even order a queue and pick your inlay designs out, so on on their website. But I guess that's about all for this segment. This is basically just meant to be an introduction video. And I'm looking really forward to seeing what kind of cues guys have come up with, what we get to film, and what is really going to take off. And, and most of all, what you, the players, and the fans, and the collectors like. Because you're the one that's going to make the decision on who wins the contest. Well, God bless you, and happy cue making if you're a cue maker. Happy cue collecting if you're a cue collector. And happy playing pool if you're just a player. God bless, and we'll see you later.